The Queen will not approve. The Queen doesn't need to know. Well, I don't approve. Regina George is flawless. She has two Fendi purses and a silver Lexus. One time she met John Stamos on a plane and he told her she was pretty. I just feel, I just feel like women, they've got ambition and they've got talent as well as just beauty. Courtney, this is not a democracy, it's a cheerocracy. I'm sorry, but I'm overruling you. You mean to tell me that you argued your way from a C plus to an A minus? Totally based on my powers of persuasion. You proud? Honey, I couldn't be happier than if they were based on real grades. What are your backups? I don't need backups. I'm going to Harvard. It's a really cool role model for girls. It's really exciting to see someone who's young and smart and uses her, her female characteristics to help her be a good leader. Picture this. It is 1999 and you are going to the movies. And what a different movie landscape it is than in 1977. Jane Austen adaptations are making money. Science fiction and action movies are frequently using male-female duos as deuterogonists. Romantic comedy is a high cottage industry. And other comedies are not quite so much at the women's expense. Long-running tropes have been deconstructed. In his newest movie, James Bond is called a sexist misogynist dinosaur, a relic of the Cold War. And Scream is a riff on these slasher films that started in the 70s. What I'm saying is that rather than coming into a dark, contemplative, and often misogynistic film landscape that Star Wars did initially, this new movie is coming out at a time when you would go to the theater expecting something hopeful and upbeat. And with a female character who's at least as important as a sidekick. If she is a love interest, then she also helps move the plot along in important ways. So while there are a lot of 90s movies I enjoy watching to this day, likely because of how influential the first Star Wars movie really was, this new one still managed to stand out. Today, we're going to explore why that is. Anyway, hello! On this channel, we talk about ladies, and this series is going to be all about exploring the way female characters have been treated over the decades by this franchise. And believe me, I know how many folks feel about the prequels, and about Padme in particular, so let's get this out of the way. We are here to talk about Padme from the perspective of someone who prefers this part of the movie, and fast forward through this one. And if you're not on the same page, please feel free to go watch one of the thousands of other Star Wars videos that may be more to your taste. You will not be so pleased when you hear what I have to say. For the rest of you, we are going to talk about how important Padme is to this story, her character arc, and the lasting impression she made. Let's get started. In our last episode, I started off by explaining how Leia is responsible for introducing most of the main plot and the galaxy as a whole to the audience. Padme serves a similar role in The Phantom Menace, so let's delve into what the story is all about. Our people are dying, Senator. We must do something quickly to stop the Federation. First of all, one of the criticisms of this movie is that it is, well, fairly complex. But I honestly think most of the flack it gets is just bad faith whining because the movie isn't what certain demographics wanted it to be. Like, look at these summaries that somehow ignore what actually happens in the movie. It would be like summarizing Iron Man 1 by saying, Nick Fury shows up to invite Tony to the Avengers. I mean, that does happen, but kind of misses the point of the film. Thought we wouldn't notice, but we did. Like, oh good, I'm glad the guy who will father Luke Skywalker is in it, and that the guy who mentors Luke Skywalker is in it. That's how I choose what to watch, based on characters who will be important later. Hey, wait for me! 
It's like, hey, I know that guy. He's going to be important in the next solo movie. So now I can actually enjoy this fight. You and I will be working much more closely from now on. I mean, ladies, we got to get into this business because what man wrote this nonsense? Anyway, so I'm just going to ignore that and go to the source to find out the plot. And the opening crawl outlines the actual problem of the movie that needs to be resolved. Your trade boycott of our planet has ended. From the Trade Federation. Trade dispute. The taxation of trade routes. To stop the Federation. The Senate would revoke their trade franchise. On the payroll of the Trade Federation. Then. Trade Federation. The armies of the trade. I object. Let I'll uh, get more into that decision later, but one thing I praised A New Hope for was that all the relevant information the audience needs to have comes from one of our three main characters. We have a couple of scenes without them, but it's very efficient storytelling and a great way to convey exposition. However, this is not the tactic used for world building in The Phantom Menace, so let's explore what has replaced it. We'll find some other way. First, I'm going to go out of order and talk about Tatooine. And here's the big question. Why does this sequence exist? Why do we go to Tatooine at all? Well, to pick up Anakin, obviously, and have this cool pod racing sequence. But this is a movie, not a Wikipedia entry. How does this impact the story? Unlike A New Hope, we don't have Luke as our POV character who learns things along with the audience as soon as he leaves home. And many people look to Anakin, Qui-Gon, or even Obi-Wan to serve this role. But they don't. That does not mean it is missing, however. Simply put, our point of view character is Padme. I'm Padme. And going to Tatooine exists for Padme to develop as a character. The queen wishes it. She's curious about the planet. Sure, we get to know Qui-Gon more and his sort of morally gray approach to things, but he does not change his ways. This is here for Padme to learn from him, and all the other characters are mainly there to give the impression of a ticking clock, especially Obi-Wan. What if this plan fails, Master? We could be stuck here a very long time. All the other Jedi-related things are set up for the sequel, not relevant to the current conflict. You could cut all these scenes and the movie would actually be better. A Marvel movie-type stinger of the Jedi might actually have been a better approach. Who the hell are you? I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. But back to Padme. How does she develop when no one else does? Well, at the beginning, we learn what it is to live on one of these central planets. We meet a queen who is very aware of the correct political approaches to everything. She listens to her advisors carefully and does what they suggest. She does stand by her principles, but we see no evidence of her choosing to handle the situation on her own without being told what to do. We must continue to rely on negotiation. Negotiation? We've lost all communications. This is a dangerous situation, Your Highness. Our security volunteers will be no match against the battle-hardened Federation Army. But my place is with my people. They will kill you if you stay. They wouldn't dare. They need her to sign a treaty to make this invasion of theirs legal. They can't afford to kill her. I do not agree with the Jedi on this. You must trust my judgment, Your Highness. Then they go to Tatooine, and she definitely breaks decoy protocol to follow Qui-Gon to town, already showing a willingness to change. Then she learns about how the other half of the galaxy lives, and so do we. I don't fully understand. This is a strange place to me. We see how slavery still exists and how useless the Republic is out here. I can't believe there's still slavery in the galaxy. The Republic's anti-slavery laws are- The Republic doesn't exist out here. And in particular, she learns how Qui-Gon's approach, so outside the standard procedure... You Jedi are far too reckless. The Queen is the not... The Queen trusts my judgment, young handmaiden. You should too. ...actually works and gets them off planet and to Coruscant at last. And look over there. Senator Palpatine is waiting for us. When she arrives to talk to Palpatine, she is a different person than when she left. She is not so easily led. A vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum. He has been our strongest supporter. That is something I cannot do. Majesty, be realistic. They'll force you to sign the treaty. 
I will sign no treaty, Senator. She argues back at him in a way she had not done before, even if she ultimately decides to go along with his plan. I move for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. However, as much as it aligns with what he wants, I would say she does this because it's true. She has lost faith in the Republic entirely. It is clear to me now that the Republic no longer functions. There are little slave children who cannot be rescued, and even saving ones still require leaving his mother behind. Who's your mother? People bet on races where folks are killed in front of them, and the Republic doesn't even care. <laughs> So now she can put a face on the folks in the Outer Rim who are suffering because the Republic ignores them. A few spaceports like this one are havens for those that don't wish to be found. Like us. And even though her people are dying, one word from the powerful Trade Federation is enough to stop anyone from caring about her either. No, I, mean, the trade. I object! There is no proof! This is incredible! She can see how them having control of the trade routes across the galaxy matters far more to the Senate than her planet ever could. The true rulers of the Republic, and on the payroll of the Trade Federation, I might add. Even though she followed all the rules and came here to copy the expected diplomatic procedure, the Senate cares as much about her people as they do about the folks on the Outer Rim. My girl has been radicalized, and she realizes that the rules may be in place to keep her busy until she gives up, instead of something put there to help those without power. Senator, this is your arena. I feel I must return to mine. I pray you will bring sanity and compassion back to the Senate. And so, just like with Leia, we learn about the corruption prevalent across the galaxy through Padme. But even more so, Leia already knows it's there and to expect it. I recognized your foul stench when I was brought on board. But we are taken along Padme's path to disillusionment with the Republic in real time. Having this story unfold from Padme's perspective means we get to be disappointed in the Senate ourselves, instead of just being told it is corrupt. There's a fan theory about why Naboo chooses young queens. The official reason is that it reduces the chance of corruption, which I'm sure is true, but what we see from Padme at the beginning is simply that she does what she's told. These men have more power than she does. All she's expected to do is agree with the advice. But after going to Tatooine, she takes charge of the final battle. Well, I do not think that we can win. The battle is a diversion. And it is her strategy everyone is following. We have a plan which should immobilize the droid army. A well-conceived plan. She is now the queen in reality as well as in name. Well, that is why we must not fail to get the Viceroy. So, overall, Padme is the only person presented as having a problem at the beginning and the only one who changes as a result of the events of the film, especially on Tatooine. And she is the only one who has a problem that gets resolved at the end. Most other characters have problems that only come up at the end and will be addressed in later movies. This isn't the first time I've said so, but Padme is the main character of this film. The plot revolves entirely around her. The overarching problem of the story is hers. She learns along the way to address things differently at the end. I ask you to help us. No, I beg you to help us. And the victory is hers more than anyone else's. She is our point of view for learning about central planets, about the Outer Rim, about the inequality in the galaxy, and about what the Republic actually values. Not people in need of intervention, but power. All of which are essential to set up for this trilogy, and it's fantastic that we learn about it alongside our lead female character. Your boldness has saved our people, Your Majesty. It's you who should be congratulated. Alright, next, we're going to talk about Padme's character arc. Longtime fans of this channel will know my first ever video was about that, so feel free to watch it if you can enjoy poor audio quality and different editing choices. I do go through the whole arc there, but as with Leia, here I'm going to illustrate how Padme's arc spans the trilogy. 
Now, Padme is a bit of a unique case in that her story ends in tragedy. So while other ladies separate from something at the beginning and successfully integrate it with the things they've learned over the course of the journey, Padme is unable to complete that. So instead, we must consider what would have given her closure. And I think she definitely gets closure by the end of Return of the Jedi, where she was right... There's good in him. I know. You were right. You were right about me. And what she fought for finally comes to pass. So this is how Liberty dies. With thunderous applause. Keeping all that in mind, let's see how her journey begins. The first step is to separate from the feminine. The feminine can take many forms, of course, so I would say for Padme that it is, well, liberty, equality, justice, all those somewhat nebulous things. However, despite how vague those concepts could be, they are very specific for Padme. Her planet has been targeted by the Trade Federation in a blockade that, if not actually illegal, is certainly close to it. So she is currently lacking all three. I will not cooperate. Now, now, your highness. In time, the suffering of your people will persuade you to see our point of view. We first meet Padme as the Queen, addressing the Trade Federation to say that she has been assured the matter is proceeding in legal and expected ways. The Jedi negotiators should be there, and this little trade embargo will soon have been resolved by the functioning government. I have word that the Chancellor's ambassadors are with you now, and that you have been commanded to reach a settlement. Except, of course, it isn't. Either functioning or resolved, honestly. She spends most of this movie trying to get things back in line with political norms before having to resort to aggressive negotiations. But for now, that is what she's separated from. The rule of law as outlined by the Galaxy's Republic. Senator Palpatine will need your help. Then I will plead our case to the Senate. The second step is to gain masculine allies. Now that our heroine is removed from what she expected, she will need some help in this new situation. Padme is no longer able to pursue political avenues. We've lost all communication. So she must instead trust to her new allies who have plans on what to do next. Your Highness, under the circumstances, I suggest you come to Coruscant with us. She agrees to go with the Jedi to the Senate, and I do really like this subtle communication between Padme and Sabe, who's currently doubling as her. Either choice presents great danger to us all. We are brave, Your Highness. From there, she accepts Qui-Gon's ideas. Well, she argues against their recklessness, of course, but she does not interfere. The Queen is not- The Queen trusts my judgment, young handmaiden. You should too. You assume too much. And when they get to Coruscant, she makes one more effort to gain masculine allies in the Senate. I will not defer. I've come before you to resolve this attack on our sovereignty now. It doesn't go great, but we'll come back to that. If this body is not capable of action, I suggest new leadership is needed. The Road of Trials is what the heroine goes through with her masculine allies. This would include the escape from Naboo, the pit stop on Tatooine, and her pleading with the Senate. I move for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum's leadership. One thing I really like about this is how we see Padme clearly develop her own political strategy. When we met her, she listened carefully to the men around her and accepted their ideas. Communications disruption can mean only one thing, invasion. The Senate would revoke their trade franchise and they'd be finished. Even on Tatooine, she goes along with Qui-Gon and Anakin, accepting their wisdom on how this world works and not really offering any other suggestions. You've never won a race? And I will this time. Of course you will. When it is time to appear before the Senate, Palpatine tells her what to do, and she accepts his understanding of the situation. You could 
call for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum. But then the Senate will do nothing, and rather than continue to obey the people around her, who claim to have her best interest in mind, she is determined to solve it her own way, which takes us to the next step. Senator, this is your arena. I feel I must return to mine. The fourth step is the illusion of success, but I must say that the success our heroine finds at the climax of this movie is very grand, nearly as effective as Leia's, and perhaps the most Padme gets in the trilogy, it being a tragedy and all. But let's pick up where we left off. Padme has decided to be the queen she was elected to be, rather than listening to advisors of any kind. Back. But your majesty, be it realistic, then they'll force you to sign the treaty. I will sign no treaty, Senator. She insists on returning home, and once there, enlists the Gungans to help. Isa, your highness? Yes, I need your help. In spite of what Shirley Protocol demanded, she reveals herself to Boss Nass and begs for his assistance. I am Queen Amidala. Huh? Definitely not going by the book now, especially with her decision to personally raid the palace to capture the Viceroy. Your Highness, this is a battle I do not think that we can win. The battle is a diversion. Well, that is why we must not fail to get the Viceroy. Everything depends on it. And they succeed! Finally, Padme honors the Gungans and Abu celebrates, ushering in what is likely a new era for her people and for the effectiveness of the Queen as head of state. You're going to have to go back to the Senate and explain all this. Together. We shall bring peace and prosperity to the Republic. However, we know this is an illusion, and we are reminded of that by this scene. Only Padme and Obi-Wan stand between Anakin and Palpatine, and Padme's efforts to restore the galaxy to a properly functioning government I pray you will bring sanity and compassion back to the Senate will turn out to have much more dire results. But we'll get into that in a later episode. If this body is not capable of action, I suggest new leadership is needed. So, to finish this off, let's talk about Padme from a more metatextual perspective. I have a series on Disney princesses, and one thing I found very interesting to track is how the princess formula was defined and revised over the years. That is a big part of what I'm going to be doing with this series, hence going in such a strange order. Well-conceived plan. My point is, when Padme was written, Leia as the lead female character in the previous trilogy was certainly being taken into consideration. One fairly minor, but to me, very enjoyable way this occurred was all the costume changes. The queen's wardrobe maybe, but not enough for you to barter with. Leia was a princess, so she should have had more options on what to wear, obviously. Padme, both as herself and as Queen Amidala, gets a ton of costume changes. I talk about all of them in the link below, by the way. But Carrie Fisher complained about her lack of outfits in A New Hope, and obviously that stuck around. You can say cynically that it made for more toys to be sold, but I would say Lucas certainly wrote these movies with children in mind, and since he had daughters, he would understand the importance of being able to play dress up. Anyway, a more serious change is that Padme is an update on the strong female character idea. I wouldn't say Leia originated the concept, but she certainly defined it as something that future movies would have to include. And as I said at the beginning, it was fairly common in 90s movies. So Lucas had to consider how to top all these imitators now that he was coming back to his favorite series. Well, first, she's a queen instead of a princess, and we see her governing her people, something Leia did not do. She has a good head for strategy, which the original trilogy certainly implied was Leia's forte, but here we actually see Padme's strategies introduced and successfully carried out in the climactic scene. The Gungans must draw the droid army away from the cities. We can enter the city using the secret passages on the waterfall side. Captain Panaka will create a diversion. Roger, Roger. 
can enter the palace and capture the Viceroy. Your little insurrection is at an end. We will send what pilots we have to knock out the droid control ship orbiting the planet. Well, that is why we must not fail to get the Viceroy. Now, Viceroy, we will discuss a new treaty. Which was never the case for Leia and the Death Stars. Padme also goes through a significant arc. She is radicalized about the political situation on screen, rather than us meeting her already having chosen a side. Which is not to say Leia had no arc, but Padme's drives the plot of the whole movie. This is your arena. I feel I must return to mine. I've decided to go back to Naboo. Though Padme is in distress at the beginning, and even a captive at one point, she has the ability to impact the plot throughout the film in a more active way than Leia did. Either choice presents great danger to us all. We are brave, your highness. Leia does have a direct opposition to the movie's main villain, but then Tarkin dies, while Padme is set up against Palpatine, who will be the villain of the whole trilogy. She makes an important political decision that brings about peace and posterity, in contrast to Palpatine, who sows discord. No, I beg you to help us. We are your humble servants. <laughs> could call for a vote of no confidence in Chancellor Valorum. And finally, Padme is used to subvert the expectations of most of the fans watching. If people talked about Luke and Leia's mother, it was only in passing. Referencing this line... Do you remember your mother? Your real mother? She was very beautiful kind, but sad. But there was a lot of theory and analysis going into how the Empire was formed, how Anakin turned to the dark side, how Obi-Wan served in the Clone Wars with him. So I would hazard a guess that most fans showing up to The Phantom Menace in 1999 were expecting answers to those questions. Instead, they were given a female protagonist who is learning about the state of the government, and we are expected to learn about it through her. It is clear to me now that the Republic no longer functions. The name dropping they might be excited about turns out to be a little boy. I'm a person and my name is Anakin. Who, though he does some pretty cool things, is hardly what they expected. Now this is pod racing. And the other name they recognize is barely in this movie at all. Yeah, I know, he has a significant event, both of them do, and it sets up what happens in the next movie. But in this movie, Padme is the person you're supposed to care about. And all those fans who never spared a thought for who the mother of their hero might be are now faced with having to empathize with her more than anyone else. Listen, there's a reason certain fanboys have always hated this movie. It's because it asks them to be invested in this young woman because she's more important to the story than their faves. You will not be so pleased when you hear what I have to say, Viceroy. I'm fairly certain Lucas didn't write this to intentionally piss them off, to be clear, but crafting a good story often means subverting the audience's expectations. Not in a sucker punch kind of way, like killing Pietro instead of Hawkeye, or having Arya kill the Night King, but in telling an actual story that's internally consistent instead of just pandering to fans. You're a funny little boy. To be fair to the critics, though, the fact that Padme and Queen Amidala are not presented as the same person throughout is a legitimate issue. She mirrors Palpatine, who is also presented as two different characters, that a first-time viewer would not be expected to realize are the same person. I am Queen Amidala. Huh? This is my decoy. <laughs> So realizing how much of everything in this story revolves around Padme is going to take a few viewings, and that's not ideal in general, and definitely not for a female character. 
It's kind of like how I talk about Black Widow in this video, where we are usually told she is doing something important in the climax of her movies, but it's not visually exciting in the same way what her co-stars are doing usually is. Padme is in a similar situation for most of this movie. What she is doing is essential to understanding what the movie is about, but it's in what is being said, not what is being shown. Yo, trade boycott. From the Trade Federation. Trade dispute. Trade group. Trade friend. Federation. No, I'm mean, of the trade. I object. Federation. And on that note, uh, this movie is for children, and discussing taxation is not an especially interesting plot to that demographic. <laughs> And going back to the summary I mentioned at the beginning, yeah, whoever wrote this is missing the point, and Padme's absence is rather glaring, but it is difficult to summarize the important political machinations that are happening. Putting Padme at the forefront of these events is a good step, but I'm very relieved that she is given something more visually interesting to do at the end. It makes her more memorable regardless of how much of the complicated plot you may recall after watching. Now, Viceroy, we will discuss a new treaty. I have another video about how the Black Widow movie is a perfect prequel, and the main reason I went into is how things you've heard about before are only included if they are important and fleshed out in this story. They are used as a way to develop our main character rather than just a reference the audience might understand. And that's what I think makes The Phantom Menace special while subverting most fanboys' expectations. Sure, there are folks with recognizable names in it, but this movie has its own story to tell. How Padme was not simply a beautiful and sad woman, but fierce and formidable in her own right, and how she became a political force at the same time as the person who would become the enemy, as one of the only people standing between him and victory. That makes this a great introduction to the story of a new trilogy. Together, we shall bring peace and prosperity to the Republic. As always, I like to end episodes by asking if our heroine was more than a love interest. In this case, the answer is pretty easy, since Anakin is a child, and so is she. Most love interest tropes do not apply. If anything, Anakin might be hers. Instead, you might ask if Padme is more than the mother of a future hero. In which case, yes, and <laughs> thank the maker for that. In this movie, Padme is how we learn about the galaxy. We also spend time with her her to learn right alongside her that the Senate is corrupt and the Republic is no longer functioning, and we get to see how she handles that by deciding to take things into her own hands instead of continuing to put her trust in powerful men. Thus, she saves the day for her people by acting against the Senate, and it will be exciting to see how else she will break tradition going forward. I was not elected to watch my people suffer and die while you discuss this invasion in a committee. Thank you for listening to me talk about our favorite queen. Next time, let's talk about how a scavenger fits into the galaxy. Please like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell, join my Patreon, buy me a coffee, all of the things so you don't miss it. See you then.